have to run off to another meeting, but I, I think it's important that we understand uh, what the families that live beside uh, the industrial wind plants are, are living through. And so I really appreciate you taking the time, and I'm going to run and leave it to these ladies. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, we'll report back to you. I bet you will. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Um, some of you, one of you have been here before, and you yes. probably remember that before you speak, you say who you are, and you might want to say where you're from or what organization you're from. And then go ahead. Senator, you want to, why don't you introduce yourself? Brian Collimore from Rutland County. I'm Dick McCormick. I represent London Dairy, Mount Holly, and all of Windsor County. I'm Claire Gare, Addison County, Huntington, and Hills Four. Senator Lyons and Senator Polina will be here when they get here. So go ahead. I'm Melody McLean from Georgia Mountain. And I've got some, the, somebody was supposed to take these copies that I had for you. Sure. And um, I, I've also posted any testimony that was submitted on okay. their, web, their website too. Okay, so find there we go. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Um, um, are you all speaking at the same time? Or um, I'm going to go first okay. and then Robin and then Leanne. So my name is Melody McLean, and I have lived on Georgia Mountain for 28 years with my husband Scott. We raised four boys there on 25 acres of land that we cleared in a home that we built from the ground up. In 2012, the Georgia Mountain Wind Project began operation, approximately 38 <coughs> feet from our home. We are one of the closest homes to the project. Since then, the noise from the project has become a dominant force in our lives. On nights that the wind is out of the south and north and the turbines are operating at half to full capacity, we cannot sleep due to the noise. I just want to make that clear that it's not all the time. The noise depends on the wind direction and weather conditions. Other neighbors around Georgia Mountain are also experiencing sleep deprivation, headaches, and depression due to noise pollution from the project. One sleeps downstairs in a recliner many nights to escape the noise in our bedroom. Another sleeps in his basement. One neighbor's son moves off the mountain to get away from the noise. We all run fans, close windows, and play <coughs> walls and windows in an attempt to escape the noise. Document, num document number one is you have there is um, a copy of the Department of Public Services reply to our recent filing of a motion for relief, which we filed on November 2nd, 2015. On page three of seven of that document, the department states that their Division of Consumer Affairs and Public Information has received 77 noise complaints from around Georgia Mountain projects since the start of the project. 22 of these were ours. The, and the, those weren't the only times it was noisy. We only complained 22 times because we never got a response. It took the Public Service Board three years and 22 complaints to act and order the DPS to investigate. In that same document, number one, page five of seven, the DPS states that it finds the issues raised in our motion to be credible or serious. They say the same can be said of complaints that they receive from other residents living near Georgia Mountain Wind and other commercial wind sites. But the limited number of complainants does not support a finding of public health impact, but is indicative of a significant impairment of our quality of life. So since there's only just a few of us, we're not the public. Um, it's very clear that we are collateral damage and the DPS is not going to help us. Their recommendation is that we find relief in the form of a pri private nuisance and or personal injury claims in Vermont Superior, Superior Court. Is this really what the state of Vermont... Did, can I stop you? Was that, yes. Is that your speculation or did they tell you that? No, they, they say okay, that. Okay, in, I think yes. I pulled it up in front of you. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's, it's not a direct quote the way I wrote it, but oh. it is in there. Um, so I'm asking, is this really what the state of Vermont wants for its citizens to file lawsuits in order to protect our health and welfare? Um, this is what we're reduced to, basically. Um, dozens of neighbors from existing projects and hundreds of for proposed projects will be left with this option if the sound and citing standards and complaint processes aren't changed. If the state of Vermont wants to promote, to ro to promote wind energy, it needs to do the work to establish the infrastructure similar to what Denmark has done. Some of this work should include the following. So these are just our suggestions as neighbors. Um, act to establish more stringent noise standards for existing and future wind installations, which may include limits on hours of operation. Clarify and streamline procedures that neighbors adversely affected by industrial wind can use to obtain relief 
If noise levels exceed the new established standards, property owners should not have to go to court to obtain relief. Make the process of filing complaints clear and straightforward and ensure that any complaint filed with the Division of Consumer Affairs and Public Information are shared with the Vermont Department of Health and logged on a public website for transparency and accountability. Stop our ridiculous policy where neighbors should police the noise emitting from a wind project and enact third-party continuous monitoring that exists in any other wind projects and airports. So the projects are policed only by the neighbors <coughs> calling and complaining that the noise is too loud. And then, so when we call and we don't get a response, <coughs> we just go on. Mm -hmm. um, Document number two is a screenshot of the continuous noise monitoring system used at the Denver International Airport called WebTrack. There is a link on this document to the web page. This screenshot show the screenshot shows noise levels around the airport, which are the green circles. This is a dynamic program and the noise levels continually change. But in this particular shot, it shows a noise level at the small house symbol near the end of the runway runway to be around 45 dBA. This is presently the acceptable noise limit emitting from the Georgia Mountain Wind Project. The house symbol on the screenshot is about the same distance from the runway that we are from the project. This is a pretty good representation of why it sometimes sounds like we live at the end of an airport runway. That's some of the noises that we hear are similar to an airplane going overhead. This is sometimes, this is also an example of how continuous noise monitoring by third parties and paid for by the owners of industrial wind facilities could put full-time monitoring in place. It is transparent and easy to navigate. The project owners do monitoring now, and nobody sees the results except for them when they write their summary. So, but the, this system you can get on a web page and you can see in real time what the levels are. Um, if the state of Vermont won't work to do the won't do the work necessary to assure that wind turbines and Vermonters can coexist, then the technology should be banned. Thanks so much for making the time for us today. I welcome any questions that any of you may have and would also welcome any of you to our home to listen to the noise. You are our last hope to reform our policies to protect Vermonters. Can we please work together to find a speedy resolution for our family and one that creates a positive environment for energy transformation in Vermont going forward? Did you have to get a price tag for the um, setup in Denver? I did not. Um, you can talk about it. Okay. I have five copies for each of them. Can you take those one? Yep. And I did also. I'm Robin Clark. I'm from Lowell. I am here on behalf of the Lowell Mountains Group and as a neighbor to Green Mountain Power's Kingdom Community Wind Project. I am president of the Lowell Mountain Group. Many of the neighbors have experienced health issues including and not limited to headaches, sleep deprivation, inner ear problems such as tinnitus, dizziness, and irritability, and the list goes on. Many do not want to speak out or go on record for fear that they will not be able to sell their homes. Several are elderly and just don't want to participate. Many are at the point of as why bother as nothing has come from any of the complaints that have been filed so far. We hit roadblock after roadblock and have to continue to jump through hoops to get complaints filed. For example, Low Mountain Group had a complaint cards distributed to the neighbors so that they could mail them into the Department of Public Service to document problems with noise. From my understanding, these complaints were just forwarded to Green Mountain Power and never made it to the Health Department. Later on, while participating in docket number 8167, this was a, a noise investigation docket, we were told that the Depar Department of Health would only take complaints from our physicians. I most recently participated in a sleep study and asked the physician if some of my problems could be related to living too close to the wind project. And he shrugged his shoulders and kind of laughed at my question. It's very difficult to get physicians involved and to put ourselves in a position to be victimized again. Kingdom Community, Community Wind 
did have a documented violation back in January and February of 2013. A show cause hearing was held six months after the violation, and it was determined that, they, that it did occur. The Public Service Board ordered that there be a continuous noise monitoring in place for one year. It has taken more than a year to get the, this plan in place. DPS hired a company that has worked for the wind industry. The equipment was put in place on the former Nelson property in April 2015. The monitor monitoring was supposed to begin in June of 2015, and to this day, no results have been filed. It's been almost three years since the violation took place. I continue to contact DPS and seem to get the same reply. They are working on it. And now we are six months through our ordered year of continuous noise monitoring with no results. And I also forwarded the email correspondence that I had with Jeff Cummins to show that um, he has been contacted. Green Mountain Power knows that there are problems with noise. That is one reason they purchased two neighboring homes, one pre-construction and the, and the Nelson Farm post-construction. I spent a lot of time on the Nelson Farm with Don and Shirley, and the noise on their property was horrific, a very strong pulsating wave-like pressure. I don't know how they managed to survive as long as they did. They, they I, did so, didn't they? To the they were bought by Green Mountain Power. I don't know how they managed to survive as long as they did. I know that selling their property to Green Mountain Power and living within its constraints of a gag order was, it was an excruciating, painful decision for the both of them. I encourage you to read Shirley's Noise Diary to learn more about what they had to endure. That is also public record. During the technical hearing, while on the stand, I asked Chairman Bowles what will happen if we find that we cannot live in our homes after the project is built. His answer was quite was simplified. You can come back to the public service board with your problem. What we did not explain is that you have to have proof backed by technical experts, which cost thousands in order for the Public Service Board to take action. Why is the burden of proof put onto the neighbors? One would think that the burden of proof should be the developer's responsibility. Everything that Lowell Mountain Group has asked for has been denied. Our experts testified during technical hearing that the 45 DBA was too high. We asked for Lowell DBA, or lower DBA. It was denied. We want a continuous noise monitoring plan in place with real-time data, with an action plan in place to resolve noise violations at the time of the violation, denied. We also requested that there be a two-mile set, setback, denied. We ask you to please support Senator Rogers' ban on industrial wind, at least until mistakes made on the current projects are rectified. We ask that continuous noise monitoring be in place on all projects, which includes real-time time data with an action plan in place to correct and respond to complaints at the time of violation. We also ask that there be a buyout fund for those neighbors who need to relocate to protect their health and the health of their children. Thank you for giving us this forum. It was very much needed. Please, not, please do not send us back to the Public Service Board, Department of Public Service, or the Vermont Department of Health. They all have been tossing us around like hot potatoes. We need to be able to sleep at night. We need you to take action. We are asking you that for help. We need a hero. Thank you very much. I have. I did not email. Sorry. Oh, okay. Could, could you email that when you have a chance? To? Yeah. Thanks. Um, that way we have it in our phone. We're stuck together. There's five copies. Just hand up the center column. We're trained. <laughs> stuck together. We're trained. I'm stuck yeah. together. Yeah. Before you start, can I just ask quickly? And you actually know this again while well, you said it doesn't matter which one. But when you issue a submit like a complaint about noise, where does it go first? The health department or the public service? We, we are going to have a chance for Q&A at the end, but time is pretty carefully to get themselves in three minutes. 
Okay. Go ahead, Nancy. Melody McLean. Um, it goes first to the project owner. And it, yeah. And normally, it, it, it's each project has its own um, um, complaint process, but that's usually the way it works. And in the case of Georgia Mountain, the times that we've complained to, to Georgia Mountain Community Event only, their response is normally we're in compliance. Okay. I'm not sure we can hear what you have to say. I want to apologize for being late. They, they closed for down you. the interstate for, I mean, they just, yeah. it was stopped. <laughs> so, but congratulations. For thank you for being here. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Louie M. Tarian, currently of Derby, Vermont. <clears throat> Excuse me. A few things have changed since the last time I spoke before you in April of 2014. On December 22nd, 2014, our family abandoned our home of 18 years in Sheffield. It was not a choice to move, it was a matter of survival. The children started sleeping through the night within a month of moving. Previously, Bailey, at three years old, had slept through the night only once. Seeger had dark circles under his eyes. They started sleep, sleeping well after leaving Sheffield. As you can see from the photos of my children on the cover page, we are physically on the road to recovery. Cannot say the same of our mental state. Seeger is in school and has, has behavioral issues that are being evaluated and may or may not be a result of living next to the Sheffield wind turbines for the first three years of his life. Exposing him to three years of what the UN and others acknowledge is a form of torture. Sleep deprivation is a form of torture. It may have long-term health effects. We do not know. We do know there are children living around Bowl who do not want to play outside. And we know there are a lot of children in, living in Rocky Ridge and Swanton who are at risk. Steve and I have sought help of a psychiatric nurse practitioner and have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. What this means in real life is when I go into a store or when the furnace kicked on when I wasn't expecting it, it takes me right back there, that sudden noise. Shirley says, Shirley Nelson says it happens to her too. The following is a written letter by our psychiatric nurse practitioner, January 18th, 2016. To whom it may concern, I am writing this letter on behalf of Steve and Luann Terrian. I am a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Newport, Vermont, and I have been seeing them individually since April 2015. It is my belief that Steve and Luann suffer from a form of a form of trauma-induced and stressor-related disorder which can be compared to post-traumatic stress disorder, in that a specific trigger or stressor in this case, the wind turbine situated near their <coughs> former home has caused them lasting negative impacts in the form of disturbed sleep and subsequent mental health issues. In this case, the anxiety and depressed mood generated by the noise and or sound waves from the turbines has continued past six months, one of the diagnostic criteria. Despite, having, despite their having had to leave their home, this has manifested in significant impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning. I also believe that having to make the decision to abandon their family home in order to regain some kind of normality for themselves and their children has manifested in prolonged depression and complex bereavement of a sort for the loss of their lifelong dream to live off-grid in a remote and one, at one time pristine area. I did not know the Tarians prior to their coming to see me, but I have heard the stories of a life that had to be abandoned out of the desperation and fear for their and their children's well-being. Steve and Luann are very resilient people, but this episode in their lives has changed them, changed them and altered the ending of the story of living as a family in Vermont's mountains. Stress comes in many forms, and in my profession, I try to help people see what their current stressors are so that positive changes can be made to alleviate anxiety and depression. In this case, it was impossible for me to remove a wind turbine from their lives. I have much admiration for their bravery and strength in trying to bring some measure of peace back to their lives, but this battle has taken its toll in the form of severe sleep deprivation <coughs> and radically altered mood that has cost them much in the way of lost income, emotional upheaval, 
and a well-deserved right to live out their lives as they originally chose it. Please let me know if I can offer other insights into the negative, I'm not going to pronounce this right, thank you, <laughs> caused to the family by the wind turbine noise. Sincerely, S. Catherine Matheson, APRN, PhD. There is a copy of her letter attached to the back on letterhead with her signature. We are lucky enough to no longer reside in too close proximity of the industrial wind nightmare. Unfortunately, there are not many as lucky as who, yeah, who are still suffering. We worry over the new victims that may be created, such as these children, pictures on the back, from Swanton, who played with my children at the Swanton Wind Fair. You cannot allow them to suffer. They shouldn't have to face what my children have or anyone else. The Department of Health needs to stop passing the buck off to the Public Service Board by going about the business they are meant to perform, protecting Vermont's citizens. They can be, this can be started by requiring all existing industrial wind project owners conduct real-time, full-time sound monitoring, and by supporting Senator Rogers' bill to ban the construction of any new industrial wind projects. You simply cannot allow areas such as Reedsboro, Searsburg, Swanton, Fairfield, Irisburg, Wyndham, Grafton, and surrounding areas who are all facing big wind turbines with developers actively promoting the intention to construct larger turbines closer to homes than caused our family to abandon our home. Thank you for allowing me this time to give you my testimony. Wow, amazing timing and organization. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, this Taryn? Yes, Taryn. Yeah. So did, are you the folks who, who were being spoken about earlier that the, that the, the company bought your place? No, from? that's the Nelson. Oh, okay. Nelson. Okay, so no, some, we've tried to get to be bought out and will not buy us out. So were you able to sell your place? Or no. Did, oh, so it's just sitting in? And we're facing tax debt because we cannot pay the taxes on land. And he has contacted First Wind. Now at Sun Edison, and I, I personally talked to Governor Shumlin, to Phil Scott. I've talked to everybody and anybody. I've sent emails to absolutely everybody I could ever possibly think of, and all we really get is, "I'm so sorry for your situation," or it's that this is not one an issue that I can deal with, so it's tossed away. Um, Sorry, I kind of went off there. So, so far, you, you and your husband, your family, you've, you've eaten the loss. Yes. You're eating the loss. And we've gone into $50,000 debt to get into a mobile home on a piece of land. So we have $50,000 debt on top of having a 50-acre property that we really want nothing to do with anymore that we cannot sell. And that we're going to lose to tax sale okay. because we cannot pay the bill. I won't say I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I guess I'd like to finish the mm -hmm. question that I asked. Because you said, you know, if you do have a, a health issue, you said you complain to the company, but it must go to either the health department or the public service board. It has to go somewhere, doesn't it? Oh, so, only if you send it directly. <laughs> only if you send it directly to the email. I guess what I'm going to ask it a different way. Who's it, on, on the state level, who's in charge of dealing with health insurance? I can speak for that part of, well, Little Mountain Group. We had little cards made up that had different health issues on it and noise problems, and they, they sent those cards to Vermont Department of, uh, Vermont um, Department of Public Service. And then it went to the health department. From what we were told during docket 8167, that the health department would not follow through on anything unless it was sent in by a physician. Mm -hmm. And that the health department refused to get involved. And then I did go to a physician who sent it in and even called up. And then they, he was told that, oh, wait, we're not doing it that way anymore. We're changing things. And we haven't heard anything else since then. So if, 
if what what would you like to see in place as a, a process and a response? So would you like to see that both the Department of Public Health and the Department of Public Service, Department of Health and Department of Public Service are responsive and that if you send it to one or the other that there's some, uh, I, I'm trying to make up a process, so what, what would you value as a process? Um, Melanie McLean. Um, we wouldn't have to complain if they were monitored full time. If, they, if the noise standards, the noise level was brought down to a, a reasonable level, it's at 45 dBA right now, that's too high. Um, this is why people are sick, this is why people are moving. That is the first thing that needs to be done. This is for existing projects as well. And then the full-time monitoring needs to be put in place, and then we wouldn't have to complain because it wouldn't be too loud. Okay, and then the in, in the event that you did have to complain, yes. where it is now, I right? Mean, short of moving it, having it, it's at too high at 45 dBA, I guess the interest is in lowering it to what? I think that's something that needs to be decided, needs not to be by just, yeah. you know, public service, but on others, right? Somebody that knows something about it. <laughs> so, but what process would you? like to have in place in terms of a response? I would like them to shut them off if they're too loud. <laughs> I'd like my complaint so to go. So ongoing monitoring and that when you submit your complaint. I'd like a telephone number to call with a real person on the end and say, what's going on? We can't sleep, it's two o'clock in the morning. Can you please just shut them off until this is figured out? So they, in the, uh, we have a written testimony online, and there are some okay. specific suggestions in there. Yes. I, yeah, not on, I mean, I didn't go into that much detail, but I think any of us are certainly willing to work with whoever will work with us on figuring out what we're going <coughs> the process and what is happening right now, because it's not working. Okay, so the last question. Yeah, uh, are your complaints specific to these this particular operation? Is there something about this, the way this particular one was, was put together? Or is this a problem in your view just with the technology in general? All of them. With all of them. All of them, yes. It's not that they built this one too close to a residence. They did. They built them all too close. How, how close is too close? We're 3,800 feet. And we have an open shot to them. Nothing between us. And we're downwind. That's, we're like the perfect storm for noise. Um, Louis and Tarion, the, um, it varies. The terrain, it all varies. Uh, because you can have, because where we were, it bounced off all the mountains as it came down, and it just funneled, funneled right to our door. We discovered when we were working with Omea, yeah, with the net, that it's not, it's not distance, it's a combination of it. That's right. But sound, sound can travel. It's, it's, it's well, certainly, but it travels in, it travels in mysterious ways. Yes, it does. It's very complicated. It's not that you can just set a standard and say it's going to be this for every project. I don't have a problem with it. It's barely audible, but I can hear the snowmakers at Kellington 30 miles away. If I know what to listen for. Yes. Well, that, okay. And the, the infrasound really needs to be taken into consideration too, which they do not monitor for, and it is a very real problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And a great job putting that timing. It made it so nice for us to be able to listen and not worry about the time.